a special one for today. Nothing but dogs on it, going one way and the other. Of course, it's all for James Harriet's book, Dog Stories. Now, you may remember from a number of years ago, the TV serial, uh, there were books published, and it's about a, a veterinarian and his practice in, uh, in England. And it's really quite a loving story. And I'll, I'll give you forewarning. I don't read sad dog stories. My father once took me to see Old Yeller and didn't tell me what it was about. I was a mess for about a month after that. So I'm not going to perpetrate anything of that nature on you. What I'm going to read to you today is just one story, um, which I found particularly appealing, and there are many more in this book. Um, and this one is called Tricky Woo. As autumn wore into winter and the high tops were streaked with the first snows, the discomforts of practice in the dales began to make themselves felt. Driving for hours with frozen feet, climbing to the high barns in biting winds which seared and flattened the wiry hill grass, the interminable stripping off in draughty buildings and the, the washing of hands and chest in buckets of cold water, using scrubbing soap, and often a piece of sacking for a towel. I really found the meaning of chapped hands. When there was a rush of work, my hands were never quite dry, and the little red fissures crept up almost to my elbows. This was when some small animal work came as a blessed relief. To step out of the rough, hard routine for a while, to walk into a, a warm drawing room instead of a cow house, and tackle something less formidable than a horse or a bull. And among all those comfortable drawing rooms, there was none so beguiling as Mrs. Pumphreys. Mrs. Pumphreys was an elderly widow, her late husband, a beer baron whose breweries and pubs were scattered widely over the, the broad bosom of Yorkshire, had left her a vast fortune and a beautiful house on the outskirts of Derby. Here, she lived with a large staff of servants, a gardener, a chauffeur, and tricky woo. Tricky Wu was a Pekingese and the apple of his mistress's eye. Standing now in the magnificent doorway, I furtively rubbed the toes of my shoes on the back of my trousers and uh, blew on my cold hands. I could almost see the deep armchair drawn close to the leaping flames, the tray of cocktail biscuits, Oh, the bottle of excellent sherry. And because of the sherry, I was always careful of my time, my visits uh, for a half an hour before lunch. A maid answered my ring, beaming on me as an honored guest, and led me to the room, crammed with expensive furniture and littered with glossy magazines oh, and the latest novels. Mrs. Pumphrey, in the high-backed chair by the fire, put down her book with a cry of delight. Trick, trick, here is your Uncle Harriot. I had been made an uncle very early, and sensing the advantages of this relationship, had made no objection. Tricky, as always, bounded from his cushion, leaped on the back of the sofa, and put his paws on my shoulders. He then licked my face thoroughly before retiring. <sighs> Exhausted, 
he was soon exhausted because he was given roughly twice the amount of food needed for a dog of his size, and it was the wrong kind of food. Oh, Mr. Harriet, Mrs. Pumphrey said, looking at her pet anxiously, I'm so glad you've come. Tricky has gone flop bot again. Now this ailment, not to be found in any textbook, was her way of describing the symptoms of Tricky's impacted anal glands. When the glands filled up, he showed discomfort by sitting down suddenly in mid-walk, and his mistress would rush to the phone in great agitation. Oh, Mr. Harriet, oh, please come. He's, he's, he's going uh, flop bot again. I hoisted the little dog onto a table, and by pressure on the anus with a pad of cotton wool, I evacuated the glands. It baffled me that the peak was always so pleased to see me. Any dog who could sit like a man who, who, who grabbed him and squeezed his hard bottom hard every time they met had to have an incredibly forgiving nature. But Tricky never showed any resentment. In fact, he was an astoundingly equitable little animal bursting with intelligence, and I was genuinely attached to him. It was a pleasure to be his personal physician. Squeezing over, I lifted my patient from the table, noticing uh, the increased weight, the padding of extra flesh over the ribs. Now, you know, Mrs. Pumphrey, you're overfeeding him again. Didn't I tell you to cut out all those pieces of cake and give him more protein? Oh, yes, Mr. Harriet, Mrs. Pumphrey wailed. But what can I do? He is so tired of chicken. I shrugged. It was hopeless. I allowed the maid to lead me to the palatial bathroom where I always performed a ritual hand washing after the operation. Oh, it was a huge room with a fully stocked dressing table, massive greenware, and rows of glass shelves laden with, with toilet preparations. My private guest towel was laid out next to the slab of experience expensive soap. And then I returned to the drawing room. My, uh, my sherry glass was filled and I settled down by the fire to listen to Mrs. Pumphrey. It, it couldn't be called a conversation because she did all the talking. Oh, but I, I always found it rewarding. Mrs. Pumphrey was likable gave widely to charities, and would help anybody in trouble. She was intelligent and amusing. Oh, it had a lot of waffling charm. But most people have a blind spot. And hers was tricky woo. The tales she told about her darling ranged far into the realms of fantasy. And I waited eagerly for the next installment. Oh, Mr. Harriet, I have the most exciting news. Tricky has a pen pal. Yes, he wrote a letter to the editor of Doggy World enclosing a donation and told him that even though he was descended from a long line of Chinese emperors, he had decided to come down and mingle freely with the common dogs. He asked the editor to seek out a pen pal for him among the dogs he knew so that they could correspond to their mutual benefit. And for this purpose, Tricky said he would uh, adopt the name of 
Mr. Utterbuncom. And do you know, he received the most beautiful letter from the editor. I could imagine the sensible man leaping up on his potential gold mine, who said he would like to introduce Bonzo Fotheringham, a lonely Dalmatian who would be delighted to exchange letters with a new friend in Yorkshire. I sipped the sherry. Tricky snored on my lap. Mrs. Pumphrey went on. But I'm so disappointed about the new summer house. You know, I got it specially for Tricky so we could sit out together on warm afternoons. Oh, it's such a nice little rustic shelter. But he's taken a passionate dislike to it simply loathes it, absolutely refuses to go inside. Oh, you should see the dreadful expression on his face when he looks at it. And do you know what he called it yesterday? Oh, oh, I, I hardly dare, dare tell you. She looked around the room before leaning over and whispering, he called it a oh, bloody hot. The maid struck fresh life into the fire and refilled my glass. The wind hurled a handful of sleet against the window. This, I thought, was the life. <laughs> I listened for more. And did I tell you, Mr. Harriet, Tricky had another good win yesterday? You know, I'm sure, he must study the racing columns. Oh, he's such a tremendous judge of form. Well, he told me to back Canny Lad in the three o'clock at Red Car yesterday. And as usual, it won. He put a shilling each way and got back nine shillings. These bets were always placed in the name of Tricky Woo. And I thought with compassion of the reaction of the local bookies. The Derby turf accountants were a harassed and fugitive body of men. A board would appear at the end of some alley, urging the population to invest with Joe Downs and enjoy perfect security. Joe would live for a few months on a knife edge while he pitted his wits against the knowledgeable citizens. But the end was always the same. A few favorites would win in a row and Joe would be gone in the night, taking his board with him. Once I asked a local inhabitant about the sudden departure of one of these luckless nomads. He, uh, replied unemotionally, oh, we broke him. Losing a regular flow of shillings to a dog must have been a heavy cross for these unfortunate men to bear. I had such a frightening experience last week, Mrs. Pomfrey continued. Oh, I, I was sure I would have to call you out. Poor little Tricky. Oh, he went, he went completely cracker dog. I mentally lined this up with flop bottom among the new canine diseases and asked for more information. Oh, it was awful. I was terrified. The gardener's throwing rings for Tricky. You know, he does this for half an hour every day. I had witnessed this spectacle several times. Hodgkin, a, a dour, bent old Yorkshireman, who looked as though he hated all dogs, and Tricky in particular, had to go out on the lawn every day and throw little rubber rings over and over again. Tricky bounded after them and brought them back, barking madly till the process was repeated. 
the bitter lines on the old man's face deepened as the game progressed. His lips moved continually, but it, it was impossible to hear what he was saying. Mrs. Pumphrey went on. Well, he was playing his game, and oh, he does adore it so, when suddenly, without warning, he went crack a dog. He forgot all about the rings and began to run around in circles, barking and yelping in such a strange way. Then he fell over on his side and lay like a dead thing. Do you know, Mr. Harriet? I, I really thought he was dead. Oh, he lay so perfectly still. And what hurt me most was that Hodgkin began to laugh. He has been with me for 24 years, and I have never even seen him smile. And yet, when he looked down at that still form, he broke into a queer, high-pitched crackle. Oh, it was horrid. I was just going to rush to the telephone when Tricky got up and walked away. Well, he seemed perfectly normal. Hysteria, I thought, brought on by wrong feeding and over excitement. I put down my glass and fixed Mrs. Pomfrey with a severe glare. Now look, this is just what I was talking about. If you persist in feeding all that fancy rubbish to Tricky, you are going to ruin his health. You really must get him on a, a sensible dog diet of one or at the most two small meals uh, of meat and brown bread or a little biscuit and nothing in between. Oh, Mrs. Pomfrey shrank into her chair, a picture of abject guilt. Oh, please, don't, don't speak to me like that. I, I, I do try to give him the right things, but it is so difficult when, when he begs for his little titbits. I can't refuse him. She dabbed her eye with a handkerchief. But I was unrelenting. All right, Mrs. Pumphrey, it's up to you. But I warn you that if you go on as you are doing, Tricky will go cracker dog more and more often. I left the cozy haven with reluctance, pausing on the gravel drive to look back at Mrs. Pomfrey, waving and Tricky, as always, standing against the window, his wide mouth face apparently in the middle of a hearty laugh. Driving home, I mused on the many advantages of being Tricky's uncle. When he went to the seaside, he sent me boxes of oak smoked kippers. And when the tomatoes ripened in his greenhouse, he sent me a pound or two each week. Tins of tobacco arrived regularly, sometimes with a, a photograph, carrying a, a loving expression. But it was when the Christmas hamper arrived from Fortnum and Mason's that I decided that I was on a really good thing, which should be helped on a little bit. Hitherto, I had merely rung up and thanked Mrs. Pomfrey for the gifts, and she had been rather cool, pointing out that it, it was Tricky who had sent the things, and he was the one who should be thanked. With the arrival of the hamper, it came to me blindingly that I had been guilty of a grave error of tactics. I set myself to compose a letter to Trixie, 
Avoiding Siegfried's sardonic eye, I thanked my doggy nephew for his Christmas gifts and for all his generosity in the past. I expressed my sincere hopes that the festive fair had not affected his delicate digestion and suggested that if he did experience any discomfort, he should have recourse to the black powder his uncle always prescribed. A vague feeling of professional shame was easily swamped by floating visions of kippers, tomatoes, and hampers. I addressed the envelope to Master Tricky Pumphrey, Barlby Grange, and slipped it into the post box with only a slight feeling of guilt. On my next visit, Mrs. Pomfrey drew me to one side. Mr. Harriet, she whispered, Tricky, adored your charming letter, and he will keep it always. But he was very put out about one thing. You addressed it to Master Tricky. Oh, and he does insist on Mr. Oh, he was dreadfully affronted at first, quite beside himself, but when he saw it was from you, he soon recovered his good temper. I can't think why he should have these little prejudices. Perhaps it is because he is an only dog. I do think an only dog develops more prejudices than one from a large family. Entering Skeldale House was like returning to a colder world. Siegfried bumped into me in the passage. <laughs> Who have we here? Why, I do believe it's our dear Uncle Harriet. And what have you been doing, Uncle? Slaving away at Barlby Grange, I expect. Poor fellow, you must be tired out. Do you really think it's worth uh, working your fingers to the bone for another hamper? Even in the most high-powered small animal practice with a wide spectrum of clients, Mrs. Pumphrey would have been remarkable. But to me, working daily with the earthy farmers in rough conditions, she was almost unreal. Her drawing room was a warm haven in my hard life, and Tricky Wu, a lovable patient. The little peak with his eccentric ailments has captured the affection of people all over the world, and I have received countless letters about him. He lived to a great age, flop-butting, but happily right to the end. Mrs. Pomfrey was 88 when she died. She was one of the few who recognized herself in my books. And I know she appreciated the fun because when I stopped writing about her, she wrote to me saying, there's nothing to laugh at now. I wonder if she had her tongue in her cheek the whole time. Oh, discover more loving stories from James Harriet's dog stories. And let me tell you, next Wednesday, oh, ho, 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 have I found a treasure for you, but I'm not saying anything more about it. Au revoir. That was a hint.